Famous for its medieval churches and markets, Cologne is also a showcase for art. But in 1981, one visitor came to sell. Negotiations were discreet. The seller was a kind of international celebrity and wanted to remain anonymous. But there was another reason for secrecy at the auction house. The valuable paintings were acquired in the Nazi era, possibly from Jewish victims forced to sell their possessions. The anonymous seller pocketed around a million Deutschmarks in cash. It was another jackpot for a remarkable survivor, Hitler's loyal architect and armaments minister, Albert Speer. He was Hitler's favorite. At one point, tipped to succeed the Nazi dictator. Albert Speer kept the Nazi war machine rolling using slave labor and the concentration camp system. But all through his long life, he played the unsuspecting bystander, the good Nazi, and slipped through the hangman's rope. If the judges at Nuremberg, the International Military Tribunal, knew then what we know now about Speer, I think he would have been included amongst those major war criminals who were executed. But Albert Speer was a canny survivor. Speer was an incredibly lucky man, and he played a real blinder at Nuremberg and totally hoodwinked the prosecution, in my view. He played the penitent man. Sorry, but not personally culpable. Speer kept the Third Reich on its legs, kept it going, and that makes him culpable for all the crimes committed during that period. He manipulated and marketed his Nazi memoirs and made a fortune. His meteoric rise in Hitler's regime was secured in 1933. The 28-year-old became the dictator's architect employed to bring Hitler's grandiose plans and visions to life. Designing the grounds, banners and lighting for the great 1934 Nuremberg rally was his first big assignment. Albert Speer delivered the spectacle Hitler demanded. He became the dictator's confidant. Few enjoyed such intimate access. If Hitler had had a friend, it would have been me, Speer would claim later. After Nuremberg, greater responsibilities were to come. In 1937, Hitler entrusted his architect with the reconfiguration of Berlin. Professor Speer was in charge of the greatest building project of all time. He would boast that he had built the new Reich Chancellery in just one year. The ambitious architect relished his position and power. Hitler was the devil, uh, the closest thing we've ever had as a human race to a devil. And uh, Speer did make a pact with him that, you know, he can't have failed to notice that Hitler's program wasn't exactly perfect, but it was a tremendous opportunity for someone who was prepared to take it with both hands, and that's what he did. Speer delivered what his Führer wanted and became recognized as a great organizer and builder. He was to be the architect of Hitler's fantasy city dubbed Germania, the world capital of a greater Nazi Reich. Transforming Berlin, this is what the dictator had in mind, and Albert Speer was in charge of creating it. An imposing monument to Nazism, Germania would dwarf London and Paris, but there was no room for Jews or other enemies of the Reich. More than 20,000 Jewish apartments were destroyed in Albert Speer's rebuilding project. Around 100,000 people were displaced. Historian Heinrich Schwendelmann has no doubts about Albert Speer's guilt surrounding the so-called de-Jewification of Berlin. 
The deciding factor for me was his relationship with the SS. Speer's authorities would order we need this and that apartment and these Jews. The Berlin Jews were then deported. It was cooperation, and I can't imagine Speer didn't know anything about it. That's completely impossible. Albert Speer condemned thousands of people to the concentration camps and certain death. He also used them as a source of slave labor. We know that Speer visited several concentration camps. With his own eyes, he saw the atrocities that were being uh, committed against prisoners at Mauthausen. And for him to have sent thousands of tons of steel to Auschwitz for the construction of a synthetic oil plant that relied on slave labor, without knowing about the presence of the slave labor and the camps there and the atrocious conditions, is simply inconceivable. Albert Speer witnessed many things. After the Nazi conquest of France, it was Albert Speer who posed beside his Führer in front of the Eiffel Tower. There were rich pickings for the Führer's favorites in the occupied territories. Albert Speer started collecting art. Records prove that many Jews and other targets of Nazi violence were forced to sell their possessions before they fled. Others were simply stripped of their belongings. These included valuable paintings. It wasn't terribly important to Speer whether they, they came from Jewish collectors or not. He, he was not going to be so crass, so ostentatious like Goering. That was not his style, and he was more subtle. But if they had been legally Aryanized and expropriated, and if they had been laundered through an auction house and a dealer, I don't think it mattered a great deal to, to Speer. Speer became one of the biggest buyers of acquired art. He even used Hitler's principal supplier. Karl Haberstock had a reputation that he didn't care too much about where his pieces came from. From 1938, Professor Speer bought six early romantic paintings from Hitler's easygoing dealer. They included an Italian landscape by Jakob Philipp Hackert and Arnold Böcklin's In the Pontine Marshes. For Speer, as one of the leaders, the directors of the German economy, of course he knew you know, what was happening and, and such. And so in his own private life, in his acquisition practices, he knew that, that there was a great likelihood that, that art objects he's, he was acquiring came from Jewish collections. He, he had no illusions there. Albert Speer's art collection and career blossomed as the Nazi-German war effort expanded. He became armaments minister in February 1942 and soon reached a position of extraordinary power. Much more than a mere architect, he organized and maintained the entire Nazi wartime economy. Speer worked closely with Hitler. He worked closely with the military. He worked closely with the SS. He was a central figure in the Nazi war effort. He kept the war going. And as long as the war went on, people were dying in concentration camps. Speer shone in his new position. He appeared to be a skillful organizer. Production output increased, even at times of high losses but his apparent production miracles came at an appalling human cost. Speer knew that forced labor and slave labor were absolutely fundamental to the German war effort, the German economy. And he used, used forced and slave labor in the factories that he controlled without any compunction whatsoever. The Nazi armaments minister achieved his production targets on the backs of concentration camp detainees and forced laborers from occupied territories. For him, they were a cheap and disposable workforce. It's yet more proof he was a key player, Hitler's high achiever. <laughs> 
er war. He wasn't just someone who knew about things, he was directly involved. He knew about all this. He was a criminal. A criminal worse than the rest, with the probable exception of Himmler. Albert Speer remained at Hitler's side until the last days of the war. After fleeing the ruins of Berlin, he had a vital stop to make. An estate in the surrounding countryside of Brandenburg. As a young architect, he had renovated it for family friend and confidant, Robert Frank. Robert Frank had stored Speer's valuable collection of about 30 paintings at his country house. As the Red Army closed in, Hitler's armaments minister was desperate to rescue them. If captured, the paintings could raise dangerous, potentially incriminating evidence about Jewish ownership. On the night of the 23rd of April, 1945, Speer personally supervised their removal. Albert Speer certainly belonged to the corrupt Nazi elite. The Nazi elite was a kleptocracy, and Albert Speer was part of that kleptocracy. Now, I knew Speer had collected a great deal of art, and there were reports uh, at war's end that the art had been lost or destroyed in some way. And, you know, as with so many of Speer's myths, it seemed believable. The lost paintings were not destroyed, but safely stored away at the Kometsbank in Hamburg, in the name of Robert Frank. Just two weeks before Nazi Germany capitulated, Albert Speer secretly secured his art collection under another name. It was the first of many narrow escapes by a master manipulator. He was a survivor. Um, he, you know, he was, you know, he was more than a survivor, more than an opportunist. He was someone who was who was really skillful in in manipulating other people. And uh, and his art collection is a, is an appropriate symbol in that way. He had saved his valuable art, but in 1946, it was time to save himself. Albert Speer appeared before the Nuremberg war trials with other leading Nazis. He convinced prosecutors that he was an artist, unaware of the facts, and seemed to scorn his former master. Was war die Entscheidung Hitlers? Die Entscheidung war ein unbrauchbarer Kompromiss, wie oft bei Hitler. The co-accused watched with great rage how the Führer's favorite, who they had all been so jealous of, how he now pulls his head out of the noose. Albert Speer was the only senior Nazi who conceded a general responsibility for Nazi war crimes without admitting to any personal guilt. His life hung in the balance. They fell for it, because he, he was a, a defendant who appeared to be showing remorse, and the rest were quite remarkable for not doing so. And uh, I think that's what saved him. He would have hanged otherwise. Spared the hangman's noose, the man once tipped to succeed his Führer, Adolf Hitler, was sentenced to 20 years in Spandau prison. The one-time Nazi grandee was now prisoner number five. Three years after the end of the war, an American interrogator questioned him about his art collection. If you're a questioner, uh, no matter how realistic uh, or truthful or valuable an answer seems to be, uh, you always let yourself know that, uh, you know, that, that's, that may not be uh, the, the true state of affairs. Speer lied. He claimed that he only had a small collection and had not acquired anything after 1937. In reality, he had bought paintings from Hitler's chief supplier, Karl Haberstock, right up to 1940. Karl Haberstock stripped Jewish art dealers and collectors across Europe of some of the finest artworks ever collected and he sold them to the leaders of the Nazi regime for their personal collections. And Albert Speer was among his most important buyers. On the 1st of October 1966, 
he was a free man. As well as hidden art, he had another big potential earner to cash in on, his memoirs. His release created a media sensation and Hitler's architect knew how to build a fortune around it. Speer was a gifted communicator. He had a long time to work out what you might call his alibi. He found the perfect formula for taking a degree of responsibility for the atrocities perpetrated by the Third Reich while not accepting personal culpability for them. And I think he knew that, in a sense, he spoke for and to the German people, all of those who'd lived through the Third Reich. He was telling them what they wanted to hear, and they were rewarding him by buying his books, by applauding his appearances. As well as selling books, others feel he had another motivation, to clear his name from the stain of Nazi war crimes. But I think so much of his sort of mission in later life was to kind of what we now call the Chatso circuit to, uh, to kind of help clear his name and come across as a very distinguished, refined, patrician German. And that was the kind of the figure that he cut at Nuremberg that made the prosecutors feel that he probably wasn't quite as bad as all the rest and therefore didn't deserve the rope. Sie sehen ja an meinem Zustand, dass ich nach 20 Jahren noch verhältnismäßig gut aussehe. Ja? He was uniquely placed. He did have this reputation of being the honest man, the good Nazi. Um, and he was going to exploit it. And various people came along and interviewed him, and it started to build up, you know, this reputation for being the good guy among bad guys. The image of the good Nazi was a highly profitable one. Six weeks after his release from Spandau prison, he was paid 50,000 marks for an exclusive interview. He also played the penitent Nazi, claiming, I will not be able to shed the burden put on me by the enormity of these crimes. He repeated claims that he thought of assassinating Hitler and explained why he kept the details to himself. When they fail, assassination attempts have a strong tendency towards the ridiculous. That's why I mentioned the plans against Hitler only briefly during the Nuremberg trials. I swear by God. Uh, the Almighty and Omniscient. It followed evidence he'd given 20 years before. This is part of his self-mythologizing. You know, he told the story how in January 1945 he wanted to pour poison gas into an air intake valve in the bunker, and he couldn't find a ladder and you know get over the wall. And you know, I'm reminded of a remark by his rival architect Hermann Giesler, who said, "The second most powerful man in the Third Reich, and he couldn't find a ladder." If he really had assassination plans, solid, real assassination plans against Hitler, why doesn't he just pull out a gun and shoot the dictator? Hitler's former organizer and industrial supremo spent years refining his memoirs. He admitted responsibility, but never any personal guilt. His books would go on to become bestsellers. It was a very polished production and a sensation at the time because no book like that existed. It still doesn't. Um, he was a, a key insider who knew Hitler and therefore had a lot to reveal. He had the ability to create myths about his life and his behavior during the Third Reich. He wrote the first draft of his own biography, and that gave him an advantage and allowed him to portray himself as idealistic, as disavowing material gain. Hitler's former armaments minister built himself another fortune, a fortune built on lies and half-truths. He claimed that the night he spent at his friend's country house in the dying days of Hitler's Reich was without purpose or reason, when he was desperately rescuing paintings 
likely to have been looted from Jews or forcibly sold. Speer gave the impression that he didn't know anything about Jewish-owned art. He didn't know anything specific about the Holocaust. Speer had never expressed much contrition about the fate of the Jews. He had simply not discussed it. But he was advised that it would be good for his reputation, it would make um, his story more acceptable to West Germans and indeed an international audience if he at least acknowledged that the Jews had suffered terribly in the Third Reich and that he was sorry about that. Rudolf Wolters, a confidant and family friend who had looked after his affairs during his time in prison, was dismayed by Speer's self-portrayal. His old friend clearly stated what he thought of Speer's selective recollections. Dear Albert, I sit here chewing my fountain pen, torn this way and that between old friendly emotions and instinctive disgust. A criminal story couldn't have been made up in a more gripping way. Volters was, uh, a, a lot of other people too, who, former participants in the regime, were very annoyed with him, but he kept on saying, you know, it, it was disgraceful and I was, I bore part, my part of the general responsibility. And they, their reaction was, shut up for goodness sake, Just leave it, you know. But Speer continued playing the penitent Nazi. It was a role he perfected with the help of his ghostwriter, Joachim Fest. He was writing a Hitler biography at the same time, and Albert Speer was a vital contributor to his book as well. Hitler had es verstanden, die Dinge, die er vorbereitete, geheim zu halten. Es hätte mir nicht unbemerkt bleiben dürfen, wenn ich nicht gedankenlos in den Tag gelebt hätte und mich in meine Baupläne geflüchtet hätte. Ich fühle mich für Auschwitz noch heute mitverantwortlich. But cracks began to appear in Albert Speer's image as the good Nazi in 1971. Historians suggested he was present when SS chief Heinrich Himmler delivered a notorious speech in the now Polish city of Posen. In that speech, Himmler made a rare and candid statement about the fate of Jewish people in the Nazi Reich. The tough decision had to be made to exterminate these people from the face of the earth. Albert Speer had an alibi. He had left before Himmler's speech. But Speer's story didn't add up. Himmler had addressed him personally. Of course, this has nothing to do with party member Speer. You can't do anything about this. It incriminated every single person in the room. That speech was proof of knowledge and therefore a degree of responsibility. It was therefore crucial for Speer to provide evidence that he had left the meeting in Posen before Himmler made that speech, that he was not aware of what Himmler had said. Was he or was he not present when Himmler made that famous speech at uh, Poznan or Posen? Uh, and he spent an awful lot of time later in life trying to prove he wasn't there. And then, well, yes, he was there, but he missed the vital bit because he left to go somewhere else. And, you know, you, it was another aspect of this crumbling. He was a central pillar of the war effort. He was exploiting concentration camp and slave labor. He knew what was happening to the Jews. So it didn't really matter whether he'd been in the room when Himmler made his speech, because he was up to his neck in the crimes of the Nazi state. He managed to shrug it off. It's amazing. They used to say um, of... of Ronald Reagan, he was a Teflon man, and maybe Speer was a Teflon man as well. A lot of this stuff just didn't stick. But perhaps something did stick to his conscience. Albert Speer sought consolation and salvation at a Benedictine monastery where he was a regular visitor. <laughs> 
Father Athanasius Wolf became the war criminal's confidant. He once told me, you know, Father, I understand when people don't want to talk to me because I didn't say many things or said it incorrectly. I understand when people don't want to shake my hand because I was missing, but I hope there is something like God's forgiveness. And then suddenly God's name was in the conversation. Unlike the countless victims of his slave labor projects, Albert Speer could escape into religion. He was free to indulge in quiet solitude, yet even in a monastery, could not openly confess to his Nazi war crimes. He wanted to say, I didn't know about it. But at the same time, he openly said, if I had known about it, I wouldn't have been able to act. So I suppressed it in order to be able to act. That means there was this ambivalence, that he made a confession and at the same time withdrew the confession. It seems that Hitler's architect and armaments minister didn't only seek spiritual comfort. The confines of the monastery walls reminded him of the prison that was his home for 20 years. When he came to the monastery, it was a little bit of a memory of Spandau. In his own biography, he writes that he had this dream that he returns to Spandau and that the prison director welcomes him at the door and says, nice that you've come back home. The Allied prison at Berlin Spandau was where he wrote much of the material for the books that would make him a wealthy man. Although the war was over, he had escaped with his life and a hidden treasure of around 30 valuable paintings he acquired from dubious Nazi dealers. They were safely deposited in a Hamburg bank under the name of his trustee, Robert Frank. He wrote to another Speer confidant, two thirds of the pictures are stolen property. We have had great problems with these things because a part was Jewish property. Yours, Robert Frank. Stuck in his prison cell, Albert Speer was powerless to retrieve the paintings that he had desperately rescued in the last days of the war. He wrote to his solicitor, following my release, I fear there will be a public reaction should I attempt to regain ownership of a valuable collection of paintings. Yet despite the risk of a stolen art scandal, Albert Speer sold his story in print and on television around the world. He seemed to enjoy the spotlight and his popular role as a reformed Nazi. His international fame gave West Germans a representative figure, someone they could point to as uh, symbolic of how the German people had been exploited by the madman Hitler, that their, their brilliance and their talents had been put to ill uses, that they now recognised that and felt very sorry about it, but that it was, it was time to move on, that it was all in the past, and the best storyteller of that past was Albert Speer. You know that the final solution was a secret, and it was a secret to me too. I was not informed what was going on in this way, but I had a certain feeling that something is going on, a certain uncertainty. I have always with me this traumatism uh, of the extermination of the Jews, will, which will never leave me. Quite often I was uh, uh, thinking that uh, I never shall get rid of it, that this burden will ever last with me. But he could not bring himself to admit involvement in the concentration camps. It tells us he's a master of adaptation, that, that he's chameleon-like, that he's, uh, he's more than an opportunist, though he is that. Um, he is someone who, who can reinvent himself uh, as is necessary. His constant reinventions and public expressions of remorse took a toll on a key friendship forged in the Nazi era. In 1971, his friend and former comrade Rudolf Wolters had had enough and wrote, Dear Albert, you don't cease to style yourself more and more radically as a criminal for whom 20 years imprisonment wasn't enough. 
May I suggest that we only see each other again when this phase has finished? That means when you are no longer exclusively interested in your rehabilitation, your old R. Once the second most powerful man in Germany, Albert Speer cut a lonely figure. He had a cold marriage. Um, I don't get the impression he had any, any real good friends, you know. Um, so he didn't need passionate love with women. He didn't seem to need strong friendship with men. Uh, so he was a loner. He was a loner. The family home in Heidelberg seemed to offer little comfort for the former Nazi supremo. I entered the house. It was like a ghost house, the feeling that nobody lives here. I met his wife twice in passing, but I was never introduced to her. It was not a warm home. Although he was a father to six children, Albert Speer looked for intimacy outside his own family. At the end of the 1970s, Speer admitted to his wife, Margareta, that he was having an affair. That really must have been a terrible blow for his wife. And it's typical Speer again. He feels love, and once again, he is the center of attention. He doesn't take any consideration for the people who have been at his side all this time. In public, he made statements about burdens and traumas about his Nazi past. In private, he enjoyed an affair with a German-English married woman half his age. His hidden art collection, amassed from Nazi dealers during the war, was another secret. About 30 paintings had been hidden and stored by Speer's old family friend and trustee, Robert Frank. When Frank died, the paintings ended up in a garage near the German city of Bonn. They agreed to a discreet 50-50 split. Albert Speer wanted to remain anonymous. At that time, many dealers and buyers didn't ask too many questions about where such art had come from. Any more than from 1933 until well, into the 1990s, there was a roaring trade in works of art, the uh, provenance or origins of which uh, no one cared uh, to check about uh, too much uh, because many of the dealers probably knew that these works of art had at some point been stolen, looted, or had been obtained through forced sales by Jews desperate to escape from the Third Reich. At that time, in 1981, the dubious provenance of Speer's paintings could be hidden or ignored. In the catalogue, the owner was simply listed as private. The name of the previous seller, Hitler's notorious art buyer and dealer Karl Haberstock, was also left out. There is no doubt that Speer was supplied with art that was looted from uh, Jewish dealers, Jewish collectors. He was supplied with these works of art by Karl Haberstock, who was one of the great plunderers of stolen and looted art. Regardless of their provenance, the anonymous owner, the war criminal Albert Speer, was about to make another fortune from his Nazi past. The paintings were sold off gradually at the auction house in Cologne, and after each sale, their anonymous owner would collect cash payments. No receipts, no signatures, no evidence. The total sum was something like one million Deutschmark. I have no idea what happened to all that money. Later on, his widow asked, are there no proceeds left? And we answered, no, it's all been paid out. We have the confirmation here. And somehow we could then explain it. It was another woman. We heard that he had a liaison in England. Once again, it had all worked out for Hitler's former favorite. His girlfriend lived in London, 
So when the BBC flew him in for a TV interview, Albert Speer combined business with pleasure. Speer certainly played the media game. Uh, I mean, he ended up appearing on TV programs all over the world, and, and in fact, he died in the United Kingdom when he was over here for an interview. Ironically, his last interview was about looted Nazi art and Hitler's fantasy capital he helped design. He was a daydreamer, and when he, when for instance, such a, such a model, when he saw it, he was full of uh, enthusiasm, and he forgot maybe all his political problems. Meeting up with his lover in the British capital that his former boss set out to destroy, the 76-year-old could maybe forget his problems. But the London liaison would be his last. The man who kept the Nazi war machine alive died from a brain hemorrhage. His girlfriend was by his side. This is obviously, at any rate at the beginning, a happy accident for him. And uh, one could say, I hope without sounding too cynical, that it was a good way to go. Though not, of course, for the lady. But, um, you know, to... to have found something like that, and then your life is over. It's not, not such a bad ending in, in cosmic terms. Uh, difficult in detail, but... It was a merciful death compared to the fate of his many victims in the slave labor camps. Once again, fate seemed to smile on the so-called good Nazi. Speer was guilty of numerous crimes. And furthermore, his deputy was hanged. Um, so it's obviously inconceivable <laughs> that, you know, that the boss might be excused uh, and the deputy hanged and punished in that way. So I think that Speer was an incredibly lucky man. Right up to the end, Hitler's protege managed to keep up his carefully crafted persona of the ignorant, innocent and decent man. That was Albert Speer's real life's work. He had the good fortune that a lot of the stuff that implicated him personally in the persecution of the Jews uh, did not emerge for many years. And when it did emerge, the facade began to crumble. A young PhD student, Matthias Schmidt, ultimately uncovered the Speer myth. It was the armament minister's former comrade, Rudolf Wolters, who helped reveal the true extent of his crimes, including proof of the so-called good Nazis' involvement in the displacement of the Berlin Jews. The figures were recorded in typical meticulous Nazi style. Altogether, 23,765 Jewish apartments were taken over. The number of resettled people was 75,000. Later, Albert Speer ordered Walters to strike out the records that implicated him in Nazi atrocities. I suggest that the relevant pages no longer exist. I read this and knew I'm on the trail of a gigantic forgery. I traveled to Berlin and started again from scratch. And that's when the new image of Speer emerged. It was clear. Albert Speer had started the redevelopment of Berlin into Hitler's vision Germania without any regard for the Jewish population it ultimately destroyed. Since his death, historians have come to understand that he played a key role in removing Berlin Jews from their home uh, in the late 1930s and during the war, uh, and that the general building inspector, the general Bau Inspection, uh, displaced thousands of Berlin Jews who were deported and, for the most part, killed. And uh, I always think of that as the first station on a railway line that ends up in Auschwitz, when the Jews were kicked out of where they lived. All of his life, Albert Speer concealed his knowledge of the atrocities in concentration camps. Now his lies have been revealed. <laughs>
we now have documents that show that Speer knew a great deal about Auschwitz. Uh, there was one document that shows that the General Bau Inspection invests over 13 million Reichsmarks in expanding Auschwitz for war, for economic purposes. But basically, he made a career out of lying about the Holocaust. Speer accepted the deaths of thousands of Jews and slave laborers to enable his own rise through the ranks. So what remains of the good Nazi? There is no such thing as the good Nazi. And if he had existed, it certainly wasn't Speer. He had committed too many crimes for that. I can remind you of an army of millions of forced laborers, most of whom were integrated into the armaments industry. There were about 700,000 concentration camp detainees who were still alive in 1944. About half a million worked for Speer. These are facts. Albert Speer lied about his involvement in Nazi war crimes and made a lot of money in the process. As well as suspect paintings, he also secretly sold sketches made by Hitler that he had kept for himself. Speer, for his own part, he didn't want to be seen as profiting from his relationship with Hitler. And so the fact that uh, we, know, we know at least of one case where he sold uh, an artwork from Hitler that he had in his collection shows that, that uh, you know, he cared more about the money and was worried about the perception uh, in that way. And so, uh, again, you know, Speer was very effective doing things you know, out of the public spotlight and doing things quietly. And, uh, and this is another example. His efforts to get top dollar for his Hitler sketches were revealed in correspondence. The buyer offered three and a half thousand dollars. Speer insisted on his original demand of four thousand. He wrote, I enclose photocopies of three of Hitler's sketches. I regret that I cannot accept less than the asking price for any particular sketch. Once again, the architect who made a fortune on a foundation of lies was cashing in on goods accumulated during his loyal Nazi service. If we accept that this story is true, that this discreet conduct of business, also concerning the money, was intended to keep it quiet from his family and instead finance his lover, that also fits into the picture that you turn everything you still have into money. Why not hit the sketches? I don't think you have to ask any more about morality. In 2006, a Cologne auction house sold an early romantic painting by Jakob Philipp Hackert. A dubious name did not appear on the catalogue. A Jewish dealer from London paid 430,000 euros. He immediately wanted to reverse the sale when he found out the true identity of the previous owner, Albert Speer. Another secret was exposed. Speer had in his art collection works of art that had been effectively stolen from Jewish art dealers and collectors. Albert Speer became a wealthy man by manipulating his Nazi past. His lies and crimes have been laid bare for all to see. He was a very skilled liar. Uh, he was uh, very deceptive, um, you know, able to conceal information to keep secrets. Uh, he would have been a very good poker player. Albert Speer was a war criminal. He did commit crimes against humanity. And if the prosecutors at the Nuremberg Tribunal had known everything about his activities during the Third Reich, he would have hung. Everything he did after he got out of Spandau was to bolster a lie, really. It was a very, uh, a very delicate tightrope that he walked. You know, for most of the time, he didn't fall off. <laughs>